Hi, welcome back to the giant world of tiny things. My name is Maximilian and today I'm going to show you how to take stunning and high quality images of your own iris. And this is the image that we're going to create together during the course of today's video. But before we get started, let's go over the list of things which we'll need real quick. First of all, you're obviously going to need a camera, ideally one with a macro lens, but if you don't have a macro lens, don't get discouraged. You can just use close-up filters or extension tubes or reverse adapters or just use your kit lens at its closest focusing distance and crop the image in post. There are a bazillion different ways to follow along in this video and make it work. A CPL filter, a circular polarizing filter, is going to help to improve your image quality by cutting back glare and reflections, which we are inevitably going to catch in the eyeball that we're photographing, simply because it's a highly reflective and spherical subject and therefore some reflections are simply inevitable and a CPL filter helps to suppress them and therefore to make your image look cleaner and more professional. Next I highly recommend the use of a tripod because it's a perfect platform to mount your camera to and it's a great way to suppress handshake introduced motion blur and to make sure that your images are going to turn out sharp because motion blur is one of the factors that ruins a million macro photos every day and I would hate for you to follow along and take an image that you're really proud of and discover that it's not really tech sharp once you load it onto the computer. So use a tripod and the same applies for your hat or the person's hat whose eyeball you're photographing because it's just another subject that's going to move around and nobody is able to hold their head perfectly still. We're moving it slightly and we're going to move it out of focus without even knowing it. So either rest it on a tabletop or come up with a makeshift solution such as the one I'll be showing you on screen right now that I made from a store, the GoPro accessories. Or just find a DIY solution, screw together some strap lumber or use a tabletop and screw clamps or just rest your head as I mentioned it on a tabletop and put your camera on a stack of books to make it level with your eye. It's also recommendable to use an intervalometer or a remote control to avoid camera shake. Now that's pretty much all the gear that we need except for the most important part and the most crucial factor really there is when photographing eyes and that is light. And when it comes to lighting we basically have two different options to choose from, one of them being ambient light and the other one being artificial or electrical light. Let's talk about ambient light first however. Ambient light is pretty much daylight, it is light that doesn't require electricity or any kind of artificial energy, but I know there's no artificial energy, but I think you know what I mean. And because it is natural ambient light, I highly recommend doing it outside. You simply won't have enough light available indoors unless you have a really nice studio space with tall windows and much natural light coming inside. And even outside it only really is a viable option on a really sunny day. There also is another factor that makes ambient light a little less viable and that is that ambient light isn't really directed. It pretty much hits everything that is in the same space as you are and therefore you're going to get an abundance of reflection that your eye will catch because everything is evenly illuminated. Whereas if you're using artificial light emitted by a speed light for example, you can direct that speed light right onto your eyeball and you won't hit many other objects that are in the same room as you and therefore these objects won't show up in the reflection or as a reflection in your eyeball. But of course you can also get creative with it and embrace those reflections. For example, by using them to show the surrounding landscape or cityscape as a projection in the eye of the beholder. Next we're going to talk about artificial light or more precisely flashes. And when we're talking about artificial light in the context of macro photography, we're typically talking about flashes or speed lights and especially in the realm of macro photography we have a few different options to choose from. We have dedicated macro flashes and we have our good old regular speed light that looks like this. But let's talk about those macro flashes really quickly because you might think that they are a great option for this sort of photograph and 
I get where you come from. You're totally right. The quality of light they emit is beautiful. They produce a gorgeous, soft, even lighting that is ideal for macro photography if you like that look. But at the same time, for spherical subjects such as eyeballs, they are less than perfect because both options, the twin flash and the ring flashes, produce really distracting highlights and therefore they're not really suitable options for photographing eyeballs. The twin flash is going to produce two individual catch lights in your eyeball and that just can be very distracting. And the same is true for the ring flash which consists of two crescent shaped single elements and those are obviously going to produce crescent shaped catch lights in your eyes that will overlay the iris and interfere with it and look very very distracting. The best flash solution that I found is simply using a good old regular speed light off to the side at an angle of what might this be, let it be 110 degrees from your face and 70 degrees from the camera lens, somewhat like the sketch that you're seeing on screen right now and that just allows enough light to enter your eye for a proper exposure. The catch light will look somewhat pleasing and it won't be too centered nor will it be too distracting and if it's too prominent for your lighting, go ahead and experiment with your CPL filter a little bit until you're able to cut back that reflection by positioning the CPL filter correspondingly. Now that's about it for lighting. The next really important point of this video is the post-processing process or however you want to call it. It's basically editing the image on the computer and there's a few things that I figured I would need to do with my images to make them look their best. First of all that's to make sure that the pupil is really a saturated black and not some grainy deep shade of purple. That just doesn't look very good. Maybe use the dehaze function if you're using Lightroom or Camera Raw. Um, increase the contrast, that's something that always helps and use the texture tool when you're doing sharpening which I highly recommend to do make sure you zoom into at least 100% and use the masking slider that's something that I always use when sharpening macro photos and I usually have it above 60% because that's just where it works best in the realm of macro photography it also helps to hold down the Alt key or the Option key on Mac to convert your image to a grayscale while you're adjusting these sliders. In the next step we're going to load our photograph into Adobe Photoshop to create this image. And in order to do so we need to extract the iris from the picture that we just edited and to do so we're going to use the selection tool. By clicking and holding the mouse on the selection tool we can choose a circular selection and by holding down the shift and the R key on our keyboard we can drag out a perfect circle from the center of our pupil right to the edge of the iris. In the next step we're going to turn that selection into a layer mask by clicking on the layer mask symbol on the bottom of the layer section in Photoshop and there you go, we're done extracting our iris. In the next step we're going to create that radial background that you've seen in the image that I've shown you earlier and in order to do so we're going to duplicate the layer that we've been working on and then select the bottom layer of the stack that we just created. At this point you should be left with an iris that is basically floating in the center of a fairly large frame but if it's almost filling your frame now is a good time to extend the frame size with the crop tool because in the next step we're going to use the bottom layer and transform it to a size where it basically surrounds the upper layer iris and the image you should be left with should look somewhat like this. Now this looks pretty good already but it will look even better once we're done adding a black background and to do so we're going to add a solid color layer and we're going to choose the color black because that just applies a really nice contrast to our image. Now we're going to drag that black layer to the bottom of our layer stack so that it's actually in the background and you can see how that changes the image already. Next we're going to apply a radial blur filter to the outer iris which should be the middle layer in the stack that we're working on and I recommend using a strength of somewhere around 50 points because this is going to create a really nice zoom effect. And this zoom effect is going to guide our viewers eye right to the center of the image where it will then discover the tag sharp and clear iris that we've been working on. Now of course you can clean this iris up and get rid of the specks and highlights if they are bothering you personally but I can already tell you you should at least leave some of those highlights because if you remove all highlights and all reflections in that eye it's going to look rather flat and a little lifeless. Unfortunately I figured that out after doing a composite and prior to that composite I adjusted the single photos and I retouched them and I got rid of all the highlights in that iris that I photographed. 
and later on I figured out that I need to edit some back in because it just doesn't look very natural anymore. And just in case you're interested, this is the composite that I'm talking about. In the follow-up video to this one, which I link in the description below, as soon as it comes out, I'm going to take you behind the scenes of that very composite, show you how I took that self-portrait, what I had in mind when I did it, and how I merged the two photos in Adobe Photoshop. To get notified when that video comes out and not miss any future videos on this channel, make sure to hit the bell notification down below, leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the content, and I'll see you next time. Until then, stay creative and have a good time. Cheers!